Hi everyone, if you are studying for a test over the brain and its parts, I have some tips for you. Over the years, I have found that there are some mnemonic devices that can help you connect the brain parts with their functions, especially if you're feeling like there are so many parts and there are so many different functions, and maybe even you're feeling like the titles of the brain parts are unfamiliar and it's just hard to keep it all straight. These memory tricks I've picked up from other teachers and even from my own students, and they've been really helpful for me as an instructor, and I think they can help you ace your brain brain test. So let's start with the reticular formation, which can be found inside the brainstem. The reticular formation is responsible for our conscious awareness and arousal. It's what keeps you alert and responsive. You can see it depicted in the image on the screen as that bundle of blue nerve fibers. Now a memory trick to help you remember the function of the reticular formation is to focus on the part of the word tick. When I hear reticular formation, it makes me think of the word tickle. And this helps me remember its function of alertness and conscious awareness, because if you were to tickle someone, you'd find out really quickly if they were alert and conscious. They would have some kind of reaction to that tickle, but someone unconscious or in an unconscious, unresponsive state would probably not be easily tickled. Next is the medulla oblongata, which is the lowest part of the brainstem. It's pictured in a pinkish color here on the screen and it's wrapped around the base of the reticular formation. The main function of the medulla is to control our most vital functions for survival. These are the involuntary processes of breathing and heart rate and blood pressure. Now to remember the role the medulla has in keeping us breathing and maintaining our heart rate, I focus on the part of the word that sounds like metal. And if I could award any brain part a medal, hands down it would be the medulla because in my opinion, it's the number one brain part. It's the MVP, the most important player. It's responsible for two of the most important functions for survival, breathing, and heart rate. So I would give the medulla a medal. Next is the pons, and the pons is located in the upper part of the brainstem just above the medulla, and you can see it pictured here in that orangish color, and it's wrapped around the upper portion of the reticular formation. The pons has several different functions, but I typically encourage students to remember it for its role in sleep and dreaming. Now to remember this function, I think of the word pons followed by several Zs, the pons. Now using Z's is a way to represent sleep in cartoons and those symbols just help us know that the character is sleeping. So when you see the word pawns or when you say it out loud, I want you to focus on that ending, pawns, and it will help you remember that the pawns is responsible for sleep and dreaming. Next is the thalamus, and the thalamus is located at the very core, the very center of the brain. It sits on top of the brainstem, and you can see it here directly above the pons. The thalamus acts as a relay station for sensory information. When information comes from outside of your body and it enters the brain like sights or sounds, it's going to be taken to the thalamus first, and then the thalamus is going to send that information to the part of the brain that processes processes it. The only sensation that doesn't go directly to the thalamus is your sense of smell, but all other senses are going to be sent to the thalamus. The thalamus is then going to direct it to the part of the brain that's going to interpret it. Now to remember the function of the thalamus, I think of it like a secretary or a receptionist that sits at the center of the brain and answers the phone with incoming calls from the outside world. Answering the phone saying, hello, thalamus here, how can I help you today? Oh, you're coming from the eyes? Oh, that's great, let me send you on to the occipital lobe, please hold. And you can even think of the thalamus saying this phrase, thou must go this way. Thou must go that way, and that will help you when you see the word thalamus, think about how it directs sensory information to the correct location for processing. Now the next set of structures is referred to together as the limbic system. They wrap around the thalamus at the center of the brain, and I'll share each one individually with their own memory tricks. So let's start with the hypothalamus. Hypo means below, and the hypothalamus sits directly below the thalamus. The hypothalamus is responsible for controlling our inner drives. These are things that we are compelled to do to maintain homeostasis. A few of those specific internal drives are hunger, thirst, and body temperature. 
So to remember its function, I focus on the first part of the word hypo. And as you know, it means below or low. And I picture a gauge or a meter at the center of the brain that tells my body when I'm getting low, like alert, alert, our body temperature is getting too low. It's time to kick it into gear. We don't want to get too cold. We don't want to get hypothermia or alert, alert, the body is getting low on energy. Our blood sugar is too low and we need to eat. We don't wanna get hypoglycemia or alert, alert, we're low on fluids. We don't wanna get dehydrated. We need to drink some water. So when you think of the hypothalamus, it's not only below the thalamus, but that word can also help us remember that it reminds us when we're getting low and when we need to fulfill some basic needs to get back to homeostasis. Next is the pituitary gland, and it's not actually a part of the limbic system, but it sits directly underneath the hypothalamus and it works under the guidance of the hypothalamus. So I figured I'd stop and explain it here. The pituitary gland is actually a part of the endocrine system, so it's not a brain part at all. It's not made up of nerve cells like the brain parts. What it does is it sends hormones into the bloodstream to communicate that way throughout the body. It's a pea-sized gland and it's considered the master gland of the endocrine system because what it does is it sends out those hormones to communicate to the other glands in the body messages about growth and development, about reproduction and stress. So to remember its function, I think of the first part of the word in pituitary that is pit or pits, and it reminds me of armpits. And then I remember that stinky pits start in puberty and you can thank your pituitary. And that might help you recall how the pituitary gland tells your body to grow and develop. And that is especially prevalent through puberty. So stinky pits, thank your pituitary. All right, so let's get back into the limbic system and we'll focus on our next part in this network of brain parts, which is called the hippocampus. The hippocampus looks like two arms wrapping around the thalamus and the hippocampus plays a key role in forming new long-term memories and helping you remember facts and experiences. Now a simple trick to help you remember the role of the hippocampus in housing our long-term memories is in the word itself. I tell my students, you will never forget the day you see a hippo on campus. That will be a memory that you will have forever. And that would be a pretty unforgettable memory, a pretty unforgettable experience that would be housed in your hippocampus. Now the next part of the limbic system is called the amygdala. The amygdala is shaped like an almond, which is where it gets its name. It comes from the Greek word for almond and it sits right at the end of the hippocampus. The amygdala is mainly responsible for processing emotions, especially fight or flight responses, the emotional responses of fear and aggression. To help you remember the function of the amygdala, I want you to focus on the first part of the word, Amy. And think about angry Amy. And you can even picture clenching fists on the ends of the hippocampus. Angry Amy will remind you that the amygdala is responsible for the emotions of fear and aggression. So now that I've covered a lot of the parts in the inner portions of the brain, I want to focus on the parts on the outer portions that you can see. The cerebellum is the part on the screen that's blue in color, and it sits just beneath that wrinkly portion of the brain. The cerebellum is responsible for coordinating voluntary movements like balance and posture and making physical actions smooth and precise. The cerebellum plays a role in motor learning and improving our skills and actions through practice. So to remember the cerebellum's role in coordinating our motor movements, I focus on the center of the word cerebellum and I see the word bell. And when I think of the word bell, it helps me remember the role of the cerebellum because I know that a bell will not ring on their own. They need movement. Hand bells need to be shaken. Hanging bells need to be pulled by a rope. Cow bells need to be struck with a mallet. And a service bell on a desk needs to be tapped on top. All of these actions require your cerebellum to coordinate those muscle movements to help the bell ring. 
Now that outer wrinkly portion of the brain is very specialized, but as a whole, we call this outer layer the cerebrum. And the cerebrum is the largest part of the brain. It's divided into a left and right hemisphere, and it is responsible for higher level functions. These aren't always essential for survival, but they include many of the abilities that make us human. Things like sensing and understanding the world we exist in and interacting with people and making decisions about our future. Future. Now the cerebrum and the cerebellum start with the same four letters. So I usually encourage students to focus on the part of the word that is different whenever you're thinking of a memory trick. That way you don't get the two confused. That's why I focus on bell and cerebellum. In cerebrum, I focus on the end and I think of cerebrum. And this helps me in a couple of ways. First, it reminds me that the cerebrum is the outer covering of the brain, which is similar to how a drum works by stretching the that tight canvas over the frame. The outer covering is the most important part that allows the drum to function and make sound. And without that canvas, it would just be a frame or a structure and it couldn't really play its part interacting with the band. And so that metaphor helps me remember that the cerebrum is really what makes us human. Even though it's not essential to survive, it's what allows us to interact and understand and interpret the things around us. So cerebrum, Drum, cerebrum. The two hemispheres of the cerebrum are connected at the center by nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. This tissue allows for the communication and coordination of both hemispheres so they can work together. So to remember the function of the corpus callosum, I think of those nerve fibers at the center like a telephone cord or a telephone line that allows one side to call the other side to coordinate and work together. Without that connective tissue, the hemispheres could not call or communicate with one another. The corpus callosum. Now the cerebrum is divided into lobes and the frontal lobe sits at the very front of the cerebrum and it's responsible for our thinking and our problem solving. Now the frontal lobe has some highly specialized regions. One is called the motor cortex and this is responsible for planning and initiating our actions. Sometimes students get this confused with the cerebellum, but here's the key difference. The motor cortex in the frontal lobe is responsible for planning and initiating our voluntary movements. It sends the messages to our muscles to tell them what to do. The cerebellum, on the other hand, is fine tuning and adjusting those movements in real time, making them smooth and balanced and coordinated. So you can think of the motor cortex as the movement planner and the cerebellum as the movement editor or carrying out those actions. It's what helps make everything run smoothly while you're in motion. Now the prefrontal cortex is where we do our decision making, our evaluating, our critical thinking, our planning, and controlling impulses. So to help me remember that the frontal lobe is responsible for planning and for decision making, I usually tell students to think about where you would gesture when you talk about thinking. Maybe think about your teacher telling you to think, to think really hard, or maybe your parent telling you, just think about it, and to think about where they're going to gesture with their hands. And typically what you're going to notice is they're going to take their pointer finger and they're going to point right to the front of their head. You're probably not going to see them say, think about it and point to the back of their head or think about it and point to the top of their head. Usually they're going to gesture right to the frontal lobe. And ironically, that's exactly where our thinking and our decision making and our critical planning is happening right there in the frontal lobe. The temporal lobe is the region of the cerebrum that primarily processes auditory information. It helps you make sense of the sounds that you hear. It also plays a role in memory since the hippocampus lies just beneath it. To remember its responsibility with interpreting auditory information, I have two tips. One, the temporal lobe is directly behind the ears, so its location will help you remember that. But also, in the word temporal, you see tempo. And the word tempo can help you remember that the temporal lobe helps you interpret the tempo of music. Now the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe have two very important parts that play a role in our speech and language, and they are Broca's area and Wernicke's area. It's interesting that these two parts can only be found in the left hemisphere. Broca's area is in the frontal lobe and it's responsible for speech production. 
Wernicke's area is in the temporal lobe and it's responsible for language comprehension. So understanding and making sense of the words that we say. These two parts work together to help us communicate. This memory trick can help you differentiate between the two. Now, if you remember Broca Spoca, then you can remember that Broca's area is what helps you create speech or helps you speak. Broca Spoca. And if you remember Verna Key, that can help you remember that Verna Key's area is the key to understanding language. The parietal lobe is located near the top and towards the back of the brain. It's just behind the frontal lobe. And this is where we process sensory information from the body, specifically the senses of touch like pressure and temperature and pain. It also helps us understand our spatial awareness and where our body is in space. To remember the parietal lobe, I think of parietal piranha. And that helps me remember the parietal lobe's function because if a piranha chomped on your leg, you would be interpreting that pain or that touch sensation in your parietal lobe. So parietal piranha. That will help you remember this is where we're processing touch sensations. Now there's actually a really specific location on the parietal lobe where the processing of touch sensation occurs, and that's in the somatosensory cortex, which you can see identified here. And it sits just at the front of the parietal lobe, right behind the motor cortex that sits in the frontal lobe. The final highly specialized region of the cerebrum is called the occipital lobe. This region sits at the very back of the cerebrum. It's behind the parietal lobe and just above the cerebellum. The occipital lobe is responsible for processing our visual information. So to remember the function of the occipital lobe, first, I draw two little eyeballs on the two C's in the word occipital lobe, and that helps me remember that the occipital lobe processes vision. But I also remember the idiom that parents and teachers often use telling kids that they're always watching because they have eyes in the back of their head. Well, in a sense, we kind of do, not eyes per se, but we have the processing ability to interpret our visual information in the backs of our heads. So if you remember eyes in the back of your head, that can also help you remember that the occipital lobe is responsible for processing visual information. All right, so those are my memory tricks. I hope it's helpful for you. Thanks for watching.